Now, on our reading list this week, but I'm actually going to talk about it a little next time, is the very influential book by David Blight, uh, Race and Reunion, about how the Civil War was thought about, was remembered in the decades afterwards up to the 19th century. And of course, as you know, Blight talks about the triumph of what he calls the reconciliationist vision of the war, uniting white North and South, triumphing over what he calls the emancipationist vision of the war, this conflict in different memories of the war. But my only, I, it's an excellent book and a very influential. My only criticism is this. There were other memories of the Civil War out there that do not appear in his book. There is the memory of the Civil War that we have seen, uh, the, uh, which is the sort of negative memory of the creation of this tremendously powerful state, you know, the libertarian memory of the war as the time when the, fe the oppressive federal government came into its own. Whether, I, I'm not, whether one agrees with that or not, that is a often, you know, that is a trope which is often cited about the Civil War. But the one I want to refer to is the free labor memory of the Civil War. And that's not the same thing as the emancipationist vision, because the free labor vision is a white vision, fundamentally. It's about white people and what their role in society should be, as well as perhaps the former slaves. The, tr the war is the triumph of free labor. That's a vision which he doesn't write about, and someone should write that book about the, the notion of free labor after the Civil War. But, so, but as I say, there's a fundamental conflict about what that means in the 1870s, 80s. Um, increasingly, demands by workers that, for example, the government enforce an eight-hour day or, in other words, intervene in the economy, strike business people and the so-called liberal reformers I mentioned last time as a perfect example of how it is the misuse of political power that is the threat to liberty. The threat to liberty does not come from concentrated economic power. That's just the result of the natural evolution of society. It's political power that is the danger to uh, individual liberty. And part of, so part of liberty, as E.L. Godkin in the Nation magazine says, the right of each man to labor as much or as little as he chooses is the foundation stone of freedom. Therefore, if someone is willing to work 15 hours a day, there's no reason for the government to intervene to set a lower limit. Or if someone is willing to work for a dollar a day, a dollar a week, there's no reason to have a minimum wage because a freely ar arrived at contract is itself an expression of, of freedom. Um, the market, not the political process, not the, the economic market, not the democratic political system, is the embodiment of the true realm of freedom. Liberty is the right to take place in the marketplace, in, take part in the marketplace in any way you like without interference from the state. This is classical liberalism of the 19th century, uh, but it, sh it spreads way beyond these so-called liberal uh, reformers. And what's interesting is how these groups resurrect the ghost of slavery, in a sense, as a fundamental part of this of this argument to discredit efforts to influence the operation of the economic marketplace. Laws regulating labor um, conditions, for example, are not just considered bad, but they are a form of slavery. They are akin to slavery. They are depriving people of the right to dispose of their own property, including property in their own labor, uh, as they see fit. So the idea of free labor, which originated as a celebration of the independent small producer in a roughly egalitarian society, um, is transformed into a defense of the unfettered operations of the capitalist marketplace. That's one way, that's one road out of the Civil War for this notion of free labor. And as I say, it, the memory of slavery or a certain notion of slavery plays a critical role in this transformation. And it is particularly reflected in the courts, 
in the jurisprudence of the late 19th century of what we call freedom of contract jurisprudence, freedom of law, court decisions upholding the freedom of contract. Um, the courts interpret slavery not as a complex totalizing system of economic and political and social and racial power, but simply as the denial of a laborer's right to compensation for his work. And now we will see next time how the courts eviscerate the 14th Amendment when it comes to protecting the rights of blacks. Increasingly, the 14th Amendment becomes a, the, the, the defense point of the rising uh, business and the corporations. Freedom is freedom of contract, and state and, so the result of that is state and, and federal courts strike down a host of state laws attempting to regulate the economy, regulate the workplace, regulate conditions of work. In other words, the 14th Amendment, remember, no state can deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. A corporation is declared to be a person in the 1880s, and after that, any regulation is struck down as depriving them of their liberty without due process of law. Efforts to set railroad rates, effort to limit the number of hours that people can work in a mine, for example, or a factory. Um, over and over, this identification of free labor with freedom of contract is built into the uh, jurisprudence and uh, to strike down efforts to regulate business. So this is a, a major part. Anyone who's taken a legal history course or goes to law school will, will learn about all this. But it's, my point is not so much just to trace that, but how it is rooted in the struggle against slavery itself. And yet, that takes on a very different meaning in the society of the late 19th century. Now, a very different, there's not the only vision out there. There is a very different vision of free labor also being articulated, which comes out of the labor movement. It comes out of organized labor in the post-Civil War North. The Civil War gave a big impetus to the labor movement. The war was a disaster for northern workers economically, because of rapid inflation, because of all the paper money that was issued, um, real wages declined sharply in the Civil War. Actual wages went up, but they didn't go up nearly as much as inflation, so their value uh, declined. And um, after the war, the, the labor movement was very active in northern cities like New York, Chicago, demanding uh, the eight-hour day, demanding higher wages, et cetera. Uh, in the 1870s, it was decimated by the economic depression because in an economic depression where there's so many people out of work, it's very hard to uh, you know, conduct strikes. The, the 1877 strike uh, at the... Of, of the railroad workers was almost an act of desperation in a very um, unfavorable um, situation. Uh, but as I said before, it kind of reflected the exhaustion of the old issues of public life. And you can actually see this when you're, when I was doing research on Reconstruction and going through the, I, I spent a lot of time in the Library of Congress just going through the letters that members of Congress received from their constituents. And in the four or five or six years after the Civil War, most of those letters dealt with Reconstruction. They talked about the South. They talked about the emancipated slaves. They talked about Andrew Johnson. From the early 1870s, and then particularly with the Depression that begins in 1873, the letters no longer talk about the South. They talk about economic problems. They talk about unemployment. They talk about wages. They talk about hours. The, this fundamental shift in the focus of public discourse is part of the reason for the decline of Reconstruction.